Well, welcome everybody. Let's get started. And um, just a quick point of uh, webinar etiquette, <laughs> as we're all familiar with. Uh, if you don't mind, keep yourself on mute. But this this masterclass, if I know most of you have been on others, is intended to be interactive. So take yourself off mute at any point in time, and um, and and feel free to contribute, ask questions, share your point of view, push back if you got other ideas, the intent is for this to be really interactive. And I can't help but to believe, you know, Robin and I started this process almost a year ago, and we're coming up on, at least from, from our vantage point, the one year milestone with COVID. And it's, it's so hard to believe that, but as coaches and trainers and facilitators, I know many of us have had to make adjustments to how we work in a virtual environment and how we serve our clients. Well, onboarding is a really important part of that. And so in this best practices masterclass today, we're gonna to talk about some onboarding techniques. We've got five or six strategies to share with you. Hopefully there'll be one or two nuggets for you, but we'd also invite you to share your strategies so that we can learn from each other. And these best practices masterclasses are really intended um, not just to share knowledge and information, but to build community and to share best practices between each other. There's a, a ton of brilliant people on this call today, and um, I think we can all learn from each other as we move through this process. So uh, I'll show my screen here in a moment, and, uh, and then we will get started. All right, so here's our roadmap for today. Uh, I'd love to do just a quick check-in, even if it's just five or eight minutes. Uh, again, as you heard from some of the talk ahead of time, we've got people from across the country and it's nice to just get a sense of what are you noticing in the market? What are you noticing with clients? What are some of the trends that you're seeing? So we'll start there with just a, a quick check-in about what you're noticing. We'll focus primarily on strategies for onboarding clients. And we also want to hear about your best practices for onboarding clients. Uh, and so at any point in time, even though we've got sort of this set up linearly, at any point in time, jump in with your ideas on how you either leverage coach metrics for onboarding or use other techniques. This doesn't just have to be about coach metrics today. So uh, let's just check in here. Uh, number one, how, what are you noticing? And how are you responding in the marketplace today? What are you noticing either about clients or trends, uh, buying tendencies, um, any changes? W what are you seeing and noticing and how are you responding today? Who's got, who's got an update that you'd be willing to share? Brian, welcome to uh, the masterclass today. Good to see you again. Great, by the way, great uh, article by Brian on LinkedIn this week. So. Check it out, everybody, if you haven't already seen it. Uh, what, are you you. Seeing, what are you seeing in the marketplace uh, today? Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Sorry, I was behind. My computer got restarted somehow, so I jumped on my mm -hmm. phone right now while my computer's restarting. No worries. Um, you know what? Actually, for me, uh, I'm seeing a lot. I'm hearing a lot more conversations about people that are looking at executive coaching when they weren't before, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily mean that in some, I'm working on some things right now where some people have, uh, they're interested, they see the need and they see the value in some executive coaching with some people, but they're also, uh, their organizations are in some difficult financial times based on what's happened in last year and they cut, cut roles. I actually have a couple uh, and it's an interesting challenge and I love it here. Maybe there's, you guys have thoughts or maybe it's for another time, but um while uh, there have been cuts in the organization um, in spending, cuts in income, cuts in jobs, um, but they know they need to work with certain people and give them support and help. And how do they sort of work through the PR of uh, how am I, how are we investing thousands of dollars in this person to help them get better, but we couldn't spend those thousands of dollars to keep our employees. Yeah. Um, that's, that's been an interesting uh thing where I think a lot of folks kind of, some of the folks that I'm talking to can kind of lock up on, uh, maybe I better not do anything. Maybe we better wait. I don't yeah. know if anybody else has any thoughts on that or if you have any yeah. thoughts, so. 
There's an optics element to this, definitely. What are you all experiencing with regards to that? Does anyone have, have any thoughts for Brian? Jennifer. I think there's some messaging around, you look back at 2008 and the people that, that shrank back stayed shrunk. You know, and I, I, there's yeah. conversations. I have clients who were so far ahead of this because they already had a disrupt yourself before something disrupts you mindset. And if you can point that, point them to that and say, why wouldn't you invest with in the things that you decided to keep, including the people? Actually, yeah, yeah, that's a really great, that's a great point. Um, some of the and I don't know if I can find this or not, but some of the I, some of this research I've seen is companies that survived the 2008 downturn. They did two things. Number one, they they cut fast, and they did it once and not often. So you know the companies that struggle, they furloughed a few employees, and then they go through another round of layoffs, and then another round of layoffs. But the companies that really survived, they they cut quickly, but then they also invested. And I think to your point, Jennifer, um, they were then able to rebound when the economy turned. That's it. Like, so good yeah, time. good. So to your, your point, maybe there's some messaging in there that can help position you with that. Any other, other thoughts? I would just say these past couple of weeks with the, the back-to-back snowstorms, that and the cold have really, you know, things have kind of grinded to a halt. So I'm expecting a fairly big ramp up as the temperature does go up, you know, but mm -hmm. places got snow and cold that just don't know how to deal with them. Meanwhile, in Minnesota, we have 2000 snowplows sitting idle. So we've started to name the snowplow contest, wow. right? Yeah, <laughs> just tell you, we should have driven them south, right? Because yeah. uh, everybody really, uh, south of Wisconsin, Illinois, all that area has been hit so hard. It's been kind mm -hmm. of difficult to get the, yeah. get you know get people connected. It's been difficult. Yeah, without a doubt. So the, these these external events absolutely impact us. You know, Brian, to, back to your question. I think messaging is one opportunity. Um, the other thing we've seen some coaches doing is modifying their coaching packages. And so oftentimes like a coach will have, let's say a six month standard coaching package without reducing your fees or your monthly fees, um, thinking about how to reshape that package. So it could be more of a three month package or a targeted package. Um, we've seen a lot of success with that, at least in the short term. Uh, again, not minimizing your fees though. Uh, any other, I, either things that you're noticing or any reactions in response to Brian's observation? Michelle. I would just say, uh, not in response to Brian, but just something that is on the forefront right now, and that is the new app Clubhouse. So there's a lot of conversations going on there, a lot of coaching, a lot of, um, so I, I, we're just starting to pay attention to that, but that is something that we're watching as far as how to engage or how to use it, or is it appropriate? Is it, is it not um, moving forward? So that's just something that over the last couple of weeks that we've been really um, paying attention to. So I don't know if anybody else is in that boat or not. Is anyone, Suzanne, it sounds like you've seen this as well. Uh, I was just on a webinar yesterday with um, Michael Bungay Stanya. I don't know how to pronounce yeah. his name properly, mm -hmm. where he mentioned it. And I've just started reading about it recently, and I'm um, having a feeling about it, which may or may not be accurate. But because it's an invitation only site, it, the feeling I got is it was kind of almost like the, well, I'm in kind of a comment, you know, I'm kind yeah. of in the in group yeah. kind of thing, which didn't personally feel good to me. So I don't know what the impact will be is that, you know, it's kind of like, are you one of the cool kids or not kind of thing? You know, did you get yeah. your invite? Um, mm -hmm. So that, that'll be interesting to, to see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also so dividing I, Apple and non-Apple. Yeah. Another way people are feeling othered <laughs> by the whole thing. However, it's not going to stay that way. I oh, think okay. it's, it, they built a head of steam and they're, they're beta testing. So there's, they, mm -hmm. they made it a limited um, release. 
But to that point, access on that on that is really amazing. You can mm -hmm. wander into rooms with people that you would have a hard time getting an, into an actual conversation with. So that's part of what's really exciting about it right now. It has that Wild West, you know, mm -hmm. Burning Man kind of feel to it. Yeah. Do we do we know yeah. if Vladimir has accepted Elon's invitation yet? <laughs> so, wasn't that what happened? Is that Elon Musk invited Vladimir yeah. Putin to a conversation or something yeah. on it? Is yeah, what I had read the other wow. day about it. Yep. So, Fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I I I struggle to be on very well in social media. This is just the introvert in me. I'm not real good at engaging in a lot of conversations in social media. I'm, I'm because, while I'm unmuted, I'm just going to quickly comment on your topic. Is that I surprisingly have been noticing very little. I think I live in the perfect place in the country right at the moment. We had snow last weekend and it lasted at about four inches for two two lovely days and then melted and went away. Um, I live in Port Ludlow, Washington, which is up on the eastern side of the Olympic Peninsula, about a, an mm. hour west of Seattle. And we're in a tiny rain shadow since we moved out there, what's called a rain shadow. Um, and I, I sit winter after winter watching everybody get these horrific storms and we're just going like, this is kind of paradise, you know? So, yeah. um, and what I'm, and I'm feeling the same way with my clients is, is that with my clients is a mix of, I do some contract coaching and I have a, I'm getting up to almost half and half private clients and contract coaching clients, which is I'm trying to shift the ratio. So it's better paid private clients. People are, I, I'm getting more clients, actually. I'm in a much better mm. position than I was a year ago at the start of this because people who would have, uh, a lot of the contract clients are large corporations or mid-sized, um, a lot of Silicon Valley corporations and Bay Area companies. And they are investing in executive coaching in lieu of being able to hold in-person leadership programs or in-person mm. programs. So I have actually seen an uptick in business as a result of all of this. And I'm a newbie to coach metrics, so I don't really have a great, I'm, I'm kind of a new person switching from a long-term leadership development consulting with some coaching to coaching being my only real business yeah. now. So I'm still learning about my onboarding program and still delighted every time I get a new client. And um, yeah, so I don't, I don't really have a lot of best practices to share yet. I'm probably doing kind of the stamp. My husband actually has to remind me in the last two proposals I've done. And don't forget to mention code metric, coach metrics. There you go. <laughs> that that yeah. is a key differentiator that I actually put into a proposal, two proposals recently. And I thought, this is really a key differentiator. Um, mm -hmm. And I, 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 I'm, when we have time later, when we're not in the intro, I, I just launched my first pulse feedback. Um, so I'm great. I'm excited, well, that's because I'm starting terrific. to actually use the system. So yeah, that that's awesome. Well, that it's a great springboard into the onboarding strategies because one one of the first strategies that we want to talk about is how to position coach metrics up front, and it can be a differentiator. Before I go ahead, uh, Jennifer, did you have anything else? I saw you come off mute. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Okay. No. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. Always, you know, just great to hear the the um, sort of a pulse of, of what's happening. It is really a world of, of almost two economies. Certain industries have been hit pretty hard as we're seeing that impact then training and coaching. And in other industries, they're uh, maybe embracing coaching for the first time or ramping up. We're, we're noticing some pent up demand as it relates to team development. So, uh, which, which we think connects very well with coaching. But let's talk about onboarding strategies. And we have, uh, I think, six different strategies today. I'm going to share the strategy. We can explore coach metrics if it's, if it's helpful as we're sharing these strategies. And then I'm going to pause and ask you to jump in and share some of uh, your experiences, either related to the strategy or maybe something that would add to it. So the first strategy, and Susanna, it speaks a little bit to what you were just talking about is even before the coaching engagement starts is to position coach metrics in that selling process. And, and here are some quotes that we've heard clients use or subscribers use as they're positioning coach metrics. Um, number one, especially in this virtual world, let your clients know that you already have a, a coaching platform that's designed for this virtual world. Uh, let clients know that 
you know, coaching works great globally um, in a virtual environment. Um, and we've heard people say, we've certainly had this experience ourselves that coaching can be just as effective, just as intimate, just as connected virtually as it can be in person. And then in terms of really trying to position and set yourself apart, leveraging the measurement aspect and, and just stating we measure behavioral change with the same level of discipline as you would manage anything else in the business. Or we prove that people can change or we prove that people change as a result of our coaching engagements. I was just on a call with a client the other day and, um, uh, and, and they're looking at several different coaching companies. And the one thing that they said to me specifically was, we really like the fact that you measure change. And in this particular engagement, it was critically important. So again, Suzanne, to your point, um, the measurement piece and the platform can help you differentiate from other coaches that are out there. So position it during the selling process. Let me pause for a minute. I know people are doing this quite well. How do you position coach metrics before the coaching engagement begins with more of the executive sponsor versus the coachee? What are you doing? Brian. I can, I can jump in just um, Great. kind of connected to that blog I wrote yesterday. Um, my intention, I'm actually working on convincing a, 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 a company who doesn't have a budget for coaching to pay for coaching and pay for it at the rate that I want to ask for it, not the rate that they want to sort of test it at. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and part of, part of my positioning is that, um, Th this is imperative. Like, how, how can we tell? Um, and we have to be able to lay it out there. And so being able to just for so for me using that, um, using that article for reference, I came up with five little little pieces that I think are important to ensure that you get money back out of your investment, and everything from being committed and having a plan and getting other people involved and but measurement, and being able to make adjustments in real time, yeah. Uh, the other thing I said this morning, I just that's had a call great this language. I had a call this morning, uh, and one of the things I said was, you know, I do a 360 up front, and that's a real helpful starting point. But you know, it just kind of breaks the ground, and we've got to go dig in, and we've got to pull the dirt off, and we've got to figure out where to to look more. And quite frequently, I, I used an analogy with this person today. You know, we might say, for example. We need to, our salesperson needs to improve because they're making bad first impressions. Well, until we start to continue to pay attention to it and we have people monitor on a regular basis, we don't realize that maybe it's the fact that they don't make eye contact. We don't know right away, but if we're monitoring it over time and we realize, gosh, now that I think about it, whenever you're, when, so I try to draw, try to draw some analogies, you know, now that I've yeah. witnessed you in multiple first impression sales calls, I've noticed that you also tend to look away when the person talks for more than 30 seconds. That's something you can work on, you know, and then continuing to observe and continuing to make observations allows us to really uh, get good, helpful feedback that we, we won't necessarily get just from an initial investigation. Yeah, uh, that's, that's excellent. And I love, I love the language, I, I wrote it down. We measure and adjust in real time. And so, you know, Suzanne, you mentioned you just kicked off that pulse feedback feature. Well, as that data comes in, you can encourage your clients to look at the data, especially those open-ended comments, and then feed some of that data back into the action plan. Don't change the goal, don't change the behavior, but in the body of that action plan, they could change their focus for the next 30 days, or maybe what we would think of as action items. But that's, to me, that's the real time and the adjustments that you're making real time. How else um, are others positioning coach metrics, measurement um, ahead of time, again, to plant the seeds for the onboarding um, once the engagement actually starts? Susan. So I'll jump in. Um, I always work with the senior executive first. I have found that unless a senior executive goes through the process, I don't get a lot of involvement from others. I, I, I've only done it where the senior executive has role modeled it. 
by a 360 or a Google survey or coach metrics, however they want to do it, they are, you know, they, they, they have to wear a mask if they expect everyone else to wear a mask kind of thing, right? And yeah. so um, uh, I, I just kind of start at that level. I I'm, I'm, was in my head, and Brian, that's wonderful language, but I've never uh, done it without a senior executive doing it first. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, meaning they go through the coaching process first and- They do the measurement first. Oh, yeah. they do the measurement first. Yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's something just in general about the methodology where you're involving stakeholders, you're involving supporters, there's something really powerful about the process, meaning when, when people who are impacted by that leader's behavior start to see the leader ask for feedback, ask for feed forward, they start doing the same thing. And so in, in the truest form of stakeholder-centered coaching process and methodology, you would ask those stakeholders to commit to making a change as well throughout that engagement. But there's this really nice multiplier effect that I think happens. And if you start at the top, um, you really can build some buy-in and commitment around the process. Awesome, yeah, John. I, yeah, I I really love that. And of course, you know, you know, my my point of view is is coaching is an enterprise asset, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in much the same way that a poor performer drags everyone down someone who receives coaching and gets the feedback that they need and we're measuring it, we're showing that along the way, it lifts everyone up. And, and from yeah. my point of view is the more people who can be involved in supporting that person who is receiving the coaching, the better, right? And so it, that way, you know, it does kind of have that ripple effect. And on the practical side of it, from my perspective, it actually does generate more business uh, kind of approaching it that way. So. Yeah. You know, Great. prior, I mean, my my point of view was, listen, you're my client, it, you're my coachy, however I refer to you, and everything is confidential, it's all contained in this little environment, which is great if that's what is is needed for the for the moment. But I think approaching it from that perspective and say, hey, who else can we involve in this? Who else can we be talking to? Who else can you get feedback from? Right, yeah. it's kind of a key leadership development attribute. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be your coach forever, and eventually you're going to have to figure out how to get feedback and feed forward. Right, so yeah. how are you going to do that? So yeah. kind of involving as many people as possible, I have found to be really effective. Mm -hmm. uh, brilliant way to state that, John. I, I, I think you know, I, I'm doing less and less coaching in isolation, meaning I can coach somebody one on one, but. I want to involve people in the process. One, it's going to be better for the co for the coachee, um, and and two, it's going to be better for the overall team and organization for all of the reasons that you just talked about. So, yeah, you, you can position coach metrics in, in a number of ways, not just the measurement. I love the idea of positioning the the overall methodology, and that we're not coaching that that leader in isolation, but we're actually involving multiple people. Awesome. Uh, great, great idea. So the positioning or the onboarding process really can start even before the engagement begins when you're talking to your sponsors and um, and you're kind of setting up the, the engagement. All right. A second strategy that we um, talked about or that we have here is to add your content before you invite your participants. And so um, I, some people know that you can do this, others don't. You can add your participant be, into coach metrics before and, and not send them a welcome message. So what that allows you to do is then go into coach metrics and add maybe a discussion or add your welcome kit or create some assignments, whatever it is that you want to add into their account so that once they sign in, everything is already there. So you can go into coach metrics add your participant, add some content into their account. And then when you're ready, you can go back to that icon, their square, if you will, on their tile. And in the upper right-hand side, if they haven't logged in yet, you'll notice that there's a little email icon and then you can invite them and, and they'll get that welcome message. So strategy number two is get the project set up, add your participant or participants, add some content into their account and then invite them after. So let me pause there just to see, 
Are you doing that, something similar? And or are there any questions about how that works? Liz. So um, yes, this is really helpful to do the preloading. Um, and I, I do run into some challenges probably because of how my brain works uh, because I, I can't, I haven't really gotten into a rhythm yet on whether to, cause there's the two different ways that you can do it. You can load the individual things, but you can also link things together. And I forget what the term is for that. Um, uh, collections, you can create collections. The collections, right. Right, so so the um, the INTJ, my intuitive thing hasn't, <laughs> right. I haven't right. landed on something linear. And mm -hmm. um, that's probably more symptomatic of how my brain works, but maybe Susan could add some insight to that since she's known me forever. So, um, but it is, it's definitely super, super helpful to get that yeah. done ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, Susan, any thoughts on that? And then I might make a comment about the, the collections as well. Um, no, I think that, so just two observations. I find with my clients with Coach Metrics, they want me to run it. They're willing to get mm. content from me and assign it, but I've not had a lot of luck saying, launch the survey when you want, look at your own feedback they really want to guide through that process. So um, <clears throat> I tend to do that. I'm laughing with Liz because last week we wanted to share content. So we set each other up as clients on coach metrics so we could share some things. I think I told you that. Yeah, Because it's did. like, yeah, once you get a pocket of a collection that works, then how do you, you know, then you want to have that. I love the idea of having all teed up and giving it to people right away. So they go, ah, this is how it works. So. Yeah, I think that those pieces are all helpful. And yes, Liz is brilliant. Okay, all for now. Yeah, great. So um, excellent. Play around with it, Liz. Let us know if you have any questions on, on how the, the, the collections work. Essentially, uh, collection is really just any combination of resources. I'm sorry, of, of individual resources. So you might use it in a number of ways. We One of the ways in which we use it, and we'll talk about here this momentarily, is to create a welcome kit. So you might have multiple components within your welcome kit, like your coaching agreements might be one resource and maybe a welcome video from you might be a second resource or an infographic on how coach metrics or your coaching process works. And if you combine all of those together, and I'll show you an example here momentarily, that could create a really nice collection. The other way to use is, is maybe you've got a set of tools that are, that are somehow linked together. For example, Maybe you have a set of tools on a lean process or a set of tools that all apply to strategic planning. You might combine all of those into a collection. Or another option you might do is maybe you're running coaching in conjunction with a leadership development program. And maybe you've got like four modules of your leadership development program, each a component maybe surrounded by a workshop. So you might have a collection that's comprised of some pre-work another resource that includes content for the workshop, and then another resource that includes a post message or post field work assignment, all wrapped up into one collection. So there's a number of ways that you can use those collections to, to make your, your programs work. All right, so that's strategy number two, preload that content. Uh, strategy number three, let me show my screen again here, um, is to position coach metrics with your coaching client. I really should have said coach E on this slide because we've positioned it with the executives, but it's a, it's another thing to actually get your coach coaching client to use the technology. So here's what we found are best practices. Love to hear your opinion as well. Number one, assumptively use coach metrics. We don't give coaching clients a choice. This is just how we coach. And what we found is coaches just use it. In fact, we do very little orientation with them. Um, if at all, though I do have one idea in here, uh, but just assumptively use it. If you give coaches a, coaches a choice, they, you know, and, and you're kind of wishy-washy about it, you, you're going to get mixed results on clients that want to use it or don't want to use it. Uh, position it though as a coaching hub for all of the things around your coaching engagement, your action plan, your measurement, communication, 
assignments, discussions, resources, so that it's a one-stop hub for them. We've heard coaches use that language as opposed to them having to go to Dropbox and Google Drive and some things get emailed. Everything kind of gets housed inside of the Coach Metrics Hub. One practice that we've seen coaches starting to do, and this, this ties directly with strategy number two, which is preload that content. And then right before your intake session with a client, if you do an intake session, a lot of clients, a lot of coaches will have maybe that initial 45, 60, 90 minute session where you're really setting your coaching expectations and, and agreements and all that stuff. We'll send that link to your participant right before that intake session and inside of that intake session, have your coachee sign in and then just give them a quick orientation. Hey, this is where you're gonna add your action plan. This is where you add your supporters. You'll find discussions under the discussion link and resources under the resources link. It takes like two minutes or five minutes inside of that intake session. But one, you'll be guaranteed that they activate their account because you're with them right there virtually, walking them through the process if they need it. And number two, they'll get a nice quick orientation so they'll be much more likely to, uh, to use it and be comfortable with the technology. So uh, that's the third strategy, which is position coach metrics with your coaching client in addition to the executive sponsor. So let me pause there for questions, reactions um, uh, with, with that strategy. Uh, Tony. I love it. I, you know that this is something that's really hot on my list of things to do. Um, I am committed to getting that welcome package together. Uh, we have a bunch of new coaches coming on board through one of our nice. clients. And I need our coaches to actually start using coach metrics during their coaching sessions. Yeah. So this is one of the main reasons I definitely wanted to attend this masterclass because I knew this was what I needed to hear to just push me over the edge. Yeah, no, that's great. Great to hear. Thank you. Um, Tony, and that speaks to our next um, strategy, which is anything that's repeatable in your coaching process. Um, try to use coach metrics to help with that with that element. So again, trying to show my screen here for some reason, my mouse keeps getting lost. All right, so templatize repeatable aspects of your business, the, the welcome kit. I know people on this call have, have heard me, um, you know, talk about this strategy time and time again, but it's just some, such a simple thing that you can do that it won't really take a lot of time. And, and by the way, Robin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we uploaded a sample coaching welcome kit into every, every subscriber's resource, uh, resource list anyway. So I think you've got a starting point. And so, these are some examples. One, include a, a, a welcome to coaching video. Uh, it's a you know, quick video that you record, put it on YouTube or Vimeo, and then just copy and paste literally a link into the body of your, of your resource. And that video will appear very nicely and you can use it across all of your projects. So we start with just an, an maybe a welcome message and steps on, on what the next steps are. But in this particular case, we've included a welcome video. We've included our coaching agreements. I mean, if you, if you sort of coach in line with ICF standards, coaching agreements are one of the first things that we usually do. So if this is important to you and your coaching practice, my sense is that you're gonna have probably a standard set of coaching agreements with all of your clients. Why not just automate the process? So create a resource with your coaching agreements. Um, we have a resource with the coach metrics, um, how coach metrics works, that infographic. You can get that infographic on the community page. So we just added it to a, uh, to a resource so that people can understand the flow of the coaching process. And then I know many coaches start their 360 process or at least the administration of 360 process right there, right after that intake session. So why not upload the templates that you're going to use that might include um, 
a spreadsheet to collect rater information, or it might include a sample heads up email that you want your client to send out. So anything that's repeatable in your practice is a really good fit to, um, to build into that welcome kit. And it makes the, it helps you optimize your time when you're trying to onboard that new coaching client. So uh, again, Tony brought up this idea of, of, the, of the welcome kit. What questions do you have either about the welcome kit or, or ways to uh, use templates to create repeatable processes here? So does that come to them by way of an email in that form that you just shared or do they log in and see that? Do they need to log in to see that in that form? Um, I, no, haven't, what, I haven't, haven't embraced yeah, this part of the, of the software. Yeah, no, it's it's actually both, uh, Brian, and um, sorry, I'm having some really interesting issues with my mouse here. I'm going to, if I can get to my screen, uh, or if I can get to, uh, let me, I'll just explain it uh, verbally here as, as I'm fiddling around with the mouse. So Brian, when you build a resource inside of Coach Metrics, you can think about that, those resources as a library. They sit in your library until you share an individual resource or a collection with any of your individual clients. Once you share that resource, it's attached to their account inside of Coach Metrics, but that client, your coaching client, will also receive an email with the content of that resource and a link to go into Coach Metrics. So they'll get both. They'll get notified through an email with the body of the, the content of uh, the body of that resource. And then they can click on that resource or that link in their email. It'll take them directly into Coach Metrics. Does that make so sense, Brent? Yes. And I think I just kind of had an aha hit me. So is yeah. it fair to say like, so with some people I've gone back and forth between giving them a shared Dropbox folder or a shared Google Drive, depending on their platform that their company uses. Sometimes it's interesting. I work really hard to create this layout and then the new company, uh, their, their system doesn't allow them to interact with that resource. And so I think what I'm realizing right now is this might be a way to just have it be coach metrics and regardless whether they're on the Google platform or the Microsoft platform, right. they can still access these files. Yes. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So that, that was our intent is to give the coaches basically a place to house these resources, uh, create simple micro learning courses, upload documents, images. I mean, a, a resource in its simplest context is really just a combination of text, documents, images, video. And so th this is a simple example that I, um, that I use. And, and this is like quite literally copy and paste from one of the books that I wrote um, with um, a video, just a short one and a half minute clip from a keynote that I'd given and some reflection questions. There's a resource. You just wrote that blog on, you know, five ways to measure better. You could create a resource on that with some additional reflection questions. When you're ready, then you take that resource and you can share it with anybody um, that is a participant. And then when you go into that participant's account, you'll notice that that resource will show up inside of their account underneath the resources link. So they only get the resource when you share it with them. But yeah, if you're sharing documents or if you're sharing maybe a, a PDF of an assessment that they've taken with you or video, or you might even you know, share other people's videos. For example, this, uh, per, this, key, this uh, resource we created on key performance indicators, it's really Marshall Goldsmith's um, daily questions. So I just linked to a video of Marshall on um, on, on YouTube, we added a little bit of context and then we added a template so people could create those daily questions inside of a Word document or a, sp or a spreadsheet. Very, very simple. And, but we wanted to give coaches the ability to either create these resources or even mini courses um, without having to be an e-learning expert. So for example, Brian, the other uh, example that we'll often show is just a simple tool on how to coach team members effectively, for example. There's three modules, and this is an example of a collection. The building blocks of feedback, again, it's the content I just showed you with the video. 
The second module is the coaching conversation module. And it's, again, another video that's on Vimeo and then some reflection questions. And then the third module, another a little bit of text and a third video. So I might send this, this tool to clients maybe after we've had a conversation about, hey, here's a few ideas on how to coach your team members more effectively, or maybe it's pre-work before a training session or before a coaching session. So again, it allows you to add extra value um, without having to be an expert um, on e-learning or having people to go to all of these different external drives. All right. Uh, so that, quick, yeah. Quick question. So um, Brian, you referenced this and uh, this may be something that has been resolved in the past couple of years. I had a client a couple of years ago that was a government client and their IT was notoriously difficult. And so we ended yeah. up having to use workarounds um, without, you know, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole, obviously, but yeah. Um, could you just speak to that a little bit? Because Brian, you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned a client or potential client that just couldn't, couldn't grasp the platform from an IT perspective. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I guess I would say we haven't had any issues in recent times that I know of where clients haven't been able to access the platform. The one thing, and I'm just looking on our knowledge base for it, Robin can probably point us to it. I think it's in the FAQ section. Um, there are some clients that have pretty strict uh, firewall access. Um, and in that case, they might need to um, provide some information so that Coach Metrics is a known website for them. And so there's some information on what to provide uh, for those clients. I haven't seen any recent uh, issues where clients haven't been able to access Coach Metrics. Okay. Thank you, just, uh, Frank. Just to clarify, I wasn't. I didn't have. I didn't have clients have issues with Coach Metrics. What I was saying was, I might set up a process that's for Dropbox, but I'm working with a company that exists only in the Google platform. Gotcha. Uh, or vice yeah. versa. This is what I. Yeah. What I. What I meant. Sorry. Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one question about the um, sharing resources. Cause I have. Um, I, I, I love that function. It's great. Um, but so every time you share a resource, when, when the client opens it up in Coach Metrics, there's a box below that, right? So that, that's correct, Frank. Right. So I, I learned that just fairly recently, actually, um, because I read one of your resources that had a comment that said, yeah. you know, provide, provide your thoughts on this. You know, it's like you have the resource and you say, provide your thoughts on this right in the box below, you know? And so it's good for us, I think, to know that. Um, the, the downside, I guess, small downside is I sent out a resource that I personalized to one person and then I sent that same resource out to, to another person. Yes. And, um, and then I went back in and had to kind of back out of that and change it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, so there's no way to personalize resources that you're sharing with multiple people, I gather. That's, Yes, uh, that's right. So a couple things, Frank, you're right. There's a comment box that shows up at the bottom of each resource once it's inside of the participants right. platform. So you can have some interaction and some dialogue. And then, yeah, if you're going to uh, create a resource and uh, sorry to scroll up and down here, if I go over to resources and I just look at, let's say any one of these, uh, actually, let me see if I can choose um, a different one. Well, it, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll just do this. I could personalize this and I could say, um, you know, hey, Frank, watch this video. Uh, and once I save that, the hey, Frank stays in there. So if I right. want to <laughs> now send it right. to Joe or Suzanne, um, I would have to personalize it. So um, yeah, very good point, Frank. Um, it, it doesn't personalize to multiple people. Um, and so it would just have to be kind of a generic resource. Right. Just yeah. something to remember. That's all. Yeah, yeah. it's something to remember. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a good point. And maybe there's something we can do that at some other point in time. I, while we're here kind of on this topic, I don't know if you all have seen, we just released a feature where 
you can now send a discussion to multiple people. So if I click on that discussion link, um, I can copy multiple people on that discussion um, who are on, if they're on the same project. So this works great. Like if you are sending discussions to people that are either in a cohort of coaching or a cohort of a leadership development program, before discussions were only between coach and one participant, now they can, it can be sent from coach to multiple participants. So just thought I'd mention that while we were here. So long as you don't use their name. So long as you don't use their name. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's, a, it's, so, yeah. it's a good I'm point, sorry. frankly. And I, let me just double check that. Um, yeah, you would, you would have to, you know, you might address it to Susan, Robin and Tom. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we at, maybe at some point in time, we could add a feature in there where um, it pulls in the person's name automatically. We do that in other aspects of the application. So that could be a possibility in the future. Mm -hmm. Susan. Is, so if you send out a resource and that person comments on it, does that yes. comment become confidential and get tucked in under their name? Or does that comment travel with the resource? No, that comment is confidential. It stays within that person's account. And, um, uh, and the only person that sees it is the participant and the participant's coach. I'm wondering if anybody's using that as a way, like, so some of those resources that you shared, I noticed they had some reflection questions at the end. Yes. Um, is it appropriate or people using it productively where they use that box to answer the questions or does that get a little squirrely and maybe it's not necessarily intuitive for that. Um, I didn't know if anybody had any thoughts on that because when I think in terms of sharing resources, I had a lot of success sharing resources in the Google world where we'd have a live document. And then when I got to an organization who couldn't get into the Google world, I had to reset. Uh, I just wondered if there was thoughts on that. Yeah, Frank, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, what I've done is used it as the prep email that I send through Coach Metrics before our upcoming um, coaching session. And I'll do that this afternoon for some Monday sessions that I have. But, you know, what were your biggest take takeaways from last coaching session? Um, what's your most important business priority right now? Um, what other things do you want to work on, you know, in our session? So it gives them a chance to think about it, but then actually... I've had clients um, write long responses in some cases about all this stuff. So as I get like multiple paragraphs of text um, that's right below the note that I send. So it's, it's, it's great. It gives me a chance to respond even before a coaching session. So it makes the coaching session that much more productive. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things we do the same thing, we use the discussion feature for what Frank just mentioned. And, um, and part of the reason why we like to use the discussion feature is because if you label, if you label the subject lines crisply, you can create this really nice history through the coaching engagements. So here's your notes from session one. Here's a reminder and prep for session two. Here's your session two notes, reminder and prep for the next session, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that we built was the ability to create templates. You'll see that over in the left-hand side of your coach account. And if you start a discussion into Frank's point, you can create a template for that pre-coaching session reminder. It'll just auto-populate the, 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 um, the body of the message with those quite in similar questions to what Frank just asked. Then you can just change the, the name of the, of the coachee, the name of the coach, and, and then you've got your pre-coaching session message and then that'll send. And uh, once it's sent and inside of that, that coachee's inbox um, and they respond, you can, you can have a really nice interaction between coaching sessions. It helps the coachee prepare for their coaching session. It helps you as the coach get some of their reflections before the session so that you can prepare as well. All right. Um, great, really great questions. Uh, and thanks for sharing how you're using the system differently. 
Um, the other strategy for onboarding is uh, use the assignments feature. Uh, if you've seen that, it's over on the left-hand side. It's another tab. And again, oftentimes coaching engagements will start in a very predictable way. And uh, so for example, this is in the, so you can create milestones with a set of tasks underneath those milestones for all of your new coachees. So for example, coaching session one, these are the assignments that in most cases, our clients are gonna do right after that initial coaching session. Identify your raters, review the welcome kit, review our coaching agreements, begin to work on a reflection process that we have them work on. And so if you create those assignments and milestones ahead of time, you can templatize them and then you can use them across all of your projects and you can preload those into your coachees coach metrics account before they even sign in for that first time. So they've got some initial to do's to look at. Any questions or reactions to that strategy? All right, one final strategy here before we wrap up, uh, you can build this and schedule an onboarding nurturing sequence. And, and the way that you can do that is through the discussions feature, create a series of welcome messages to your clients as templates. So you can use them across all of your future projects. And then the discussion feature also has a scheduling function. So you could schedule those out to you know, be sent at some point in the future at a later date as you're going through the onboarding process with your client. So one, create a template. And then number two, create a series of discussions. Use the schedule feature so they, case, they get sent at a later date. And it's just a really nice way to, to welcome clients in a very efficient manner. And the other thought too, one of the things that we've noticed coaches are doing recently is uh, some coaches take notes, other coaches don't take notes. One of the things that you can do with that discussions feature is uh, if you take notes and you're gonna send your client a post coaching session message, at the same time, while you're in coach metrics, send a, a, a follow-up discussion to just follow up with them and then schedule it for the future. So let's say uh, Frank has an action to go and provide feedback to one of his team members, create a discussion, schedule it to go out on the day after he was supposed to have that discussion with a team member. And it's a really nice, efficient way to follow up with your coaching clients and add some extra value between coaching sessions, but you're doing it all in a very efficient manner because you're doing it right after that coaching session is over. And then you'll get notified if they respond to that discussion because the body, the content of that discussion is gonna come into your email inbox. All right, so questions, comments, what else are you doing to onboard your coaching clients? Well, I'm just going to comment on what I'm doing more than have a question. I'm Great. doing Thanks, most of these things. I thought they were sort of awesome. the basics of the systems. I took the welcome kit and adapted it right away and made it my language. And I um, created a coaching agreement. I uploaded my own coaching agreement, which I completely changed into a much shorter format to go with this. Um, and I can update easily. And I I. I start out by sending the initial sign up for the system and put your username and password in. And then I send a separate email to someone saying, you should be receiving this if you didn't check your spam filter or let me know. Mm -hmm. So they know to look for it and make sure that yep. they, um, what's the term, white whitelist um, coach metrics. And then I assign three things right away. The welcome kit, which I've added some things to the setting goals and action plan, creating your action plan, that collection, and then doing a session prep. Because I'm, I'm listening to you saying about sending reminders. I think, I think I make my clients work pretty hard. I make it their responsibility to do their session prep form and I don't send yep. them a reminder saying to do it. Um, but I have found that I needed to change the language and ask them to put it into a discussion thread. Because if they just take the resource and start responding to it, the most current ones end up at the bottom of that mm. versus at the top. So I've told them, and some of them are struggling with getting this, to copy the questions into a discussion thread. Yeah. Um, and so that I have the most current discussion at the top for their session prep goals. 
Yeah. I'm still great. working on that part of the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I, it sounds like you're using those features really well, Suzanne. And yeah, we, we all kind of do a different amount of work with our clients. Uh, it sounds like on your side, you're putting the onus on those clients to create the, to complete their pre coaching session reflection without your prompt. Other coaches will send that pre-message prompt. Uh, I think I need to start session. sending it because they're not doing it very well. Yeah. <laughs> so. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so. Awesome. Thanks for that input. Really helpful. Uh, what else? Any other ways in which you're onboarding your clients that you want to share or questions you might have? Liz. I just found that my, my current client, I learned from a previous client to spend some time in that intake session, explaining and, and letting her click through the different pieces. Yeah. We still do, um, we still do have some confusion around when to use discussions and when to use the journal. She actually found that journaling was the best technique for her. Okay, and then cool. we had the aha that the journal was locked. So she had to unlock it so that I mm -hmm. could see it. Um, right. But that actually works really well. I love the fact that there's that lockable or maybe that's how it defaults, the lockable journal so that they can mm -hmm. privately journal and then share what they'd like with you. So. Um, yeah. headline is not quite sure the difference between the discussions, the journal assignments and making comments on a resource. Yeah. Yeah. They're very similar. So discussions we typically think of in terms of pre, uh, per personalized messages, one-on-one -on -one with your clients. So pre messages, post messages, checking in between works, uh, between coaching sessions. Resources, we generally tend to think in terms of one to many. I've got a resource, it's an article, it's a video, it's, um, it is uh, some kind of toolkit that I create once and I can share with multiple people at the same time. And then journal is really intended for self-reflection for that particular participant. And then they have the choice to send that, unlock it, as you mentioned, with their coach or keep it private to themselves. So that's really helpful is because um, Robin, we just, you just made some updates to our knowledge base and we've defined a lot of the terms inside of the knowledge base. Um, have we defined some of those terms, resources, discussions and um, journals? You're on mute. Sorry about that. There you go, that's okay. Um we, we will make a, an announcement this afternoon, but we've overhauled the uh, knowledge base. So we've really um, carved out a section for your participants and, and you'll see it, it's, it's very prominent, but that should be their go-to. And what we did was really write it from their perspective. So the screenshots look like from a participant, it's really just those tools, how they would use it, how they would interact with coach metrics and the value it brings to them versus what a coach does and and you will see that um so so check it out this weekend as i said we'll make that announcement today but almost every part has been refreshed and updated um and adding all of that really step-by-step -step instruction as well as those screenshots and even um even this what we've covered today will be captured there's a new best practices section and one of those is onboarding clients so we'll walk you through kind of the steps that, that Sal has introduced today. So if you didn't get it all captured, um, it's there for your reference. Um, and we'll continue to build on this. So if you're finding information either that your client needs or that you need, shoot us a message and, and we'll be happy to build that out for you. Awesome. Can I ask Everyone, a quick question I, about that? Oh, Super yes. Quick. And uh, um, Suzanne, what, I'll, I'll stay on the line here for a moment, but I just I want to just honor everyone's time commitment here. It's 11 o'clock Mountain Time. If you need to sign off, thank you so much for joining me today. I'll stick around for a few minutes to answer any other questions. And uh, thanks for, for uh, being part of the Coach Metrics community, everybody. Suzanne. Are the resources and the knowledge base viewable and accessible to clients? Absolutely. The, without the, without the, being assigned. 
actually, let me let me take a step back. The knowledge base is available to all Coach Metrics users, so both coaches and participants, and that is the link is available in the black bar at the top. Okay. The resources again is your coaching library of material. So your clients will only so only your clients will see your material when it is shared with them. Okay. So so it's Perfect. your library and and you control access to that. Okay. Thank you. Great. All I have right. A, a Michelle. quick question on so we have a we work with an executive group of a regional bank. And we've been working with them for the last two years. And now we're trying to make the shift to get them onto coach metrics. And the pushback that we're getting is the ownership of the data. So um, mm. not that they want to say, we're not gonna work with you forever, but they're just saying there's so, there could be a lot of good information that is generated through this process. Yeah. And they want to know if we part ways at any point in the future, how do they get to retain access to that data? So I'd be curious to hear if that's come up with anyone yeah. else or how you handle mm -hmm. that. One easy way to handle it is there's a reporting function. There's a reports function on the left side of uh, coach metrics. So you, if for some reason you did decide to part ways or they're done with coach metrics and they want an export of that data, you can run a report it and it will dump all of the data into a CSV file. So that's okay. one way. Um, any other thoughts that folks are, are uh, doing around the data itself? Liz? No? Well, I, I, I was just going to say that um, one of my niche pieces is getting people to talk. And so um, I think I, I like the report function. I have, this hasn't come up for me, but I like the report function as long as we can control what information we share because i can guarantee you i've had coaching situations where as an external coach that's the only reason they're talking to me they don't want the data shared with their company yeah 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 so you can control that certainly who who sees that the coachy the coach are the only ones that currently have access to that have access to the system so michelle i don't know if that reporting function is helpful for you or not? Yeah, I'll take a look at it. I haven't, okay. um, I haven't looked at it at all. So that's, I didn't even know it was there. So yeah. <laughs> we're still okay. new to this. So I'll yeah. take a look at it. Thank no you. No worries. Yeah, let us know how that goes. And if you have any questions, um, reach out again and we'll, we'll try to support you as we can. Thank you. To add some, yeah. to, add awesome. some, to add some clarity to Liz's statement there, is it, would it be possible to run reports that certain segments of the information is shared and certain segments are protected or do we you have to make a decision that it's all going to be shared or it's all not so right now the the report function is pretty basic in coach metrics and we hope to build that out over time but what happens is the coach has the ability to um download different data and and then you and it it, it dumps into a csv or an excel file and then what you could do, Brian, is you could edit that file or that, you know, the data that's inside of that file and then only share with the appropriate people uh, what you want to share. Perfect. Thanks. Makes sense. Great. Awesome. Lively discussion today, everybody. Any other questions or thoughts before we wrap up? Fantastic. Well, let me know if we can support you with, with anything. Um, I have Fridays carved out to connect with subscribers and support people as well. So as you run into some challenges, uh, reach out to our support group, Robin heads that group and, or uh, let me know if I can support you in any way as well. I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, again, thanks for being part of our community. Great session. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Thank everybody. You. Okay. Bye-bye.